Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me and your space once again. Um, I see some familiar faces, so I know some of you have uh, met me or been to a uh, program or talk that I've been to before. New faces, good to see you. Um, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Denise Travis, and I represent Lutheran Senior Services, a division that we call Home and Community Based Services. And I say that and people are like, what really does that mean? Um, and so those are the services that come to you in your home wherever that is. So your home is here on the Mason Point campus. I think most of you are IL, maybe some of you are AL, um, but we also go into the greater community. So if you still have friends or family who are in the St. Louis area in their own home or another senior community and they need different types of services to come to them, we service outside of the LSS walls as well. So those services that come into your home are um, skilled home health, so if your doctor orders home health nurse or therapy to come into your apartment instead of going to the outpatient, um, then we have that service that your insurance covers for a short period of time. Um, we have our, what we call private duty, which, are, which is our private pay caregiver service. So if you need someone on a long-term basis or a short-term basis to come and help you with different personal things, then we have that service. Here at this community, we have Shayla, who is our, what we call a la carte caregiver. And she's the one who you might see bopping around from one apartment to the next and 15 minute increments, 15 minutes to an hour at a time. So maybe somebody just needs you to come in in the morning to help them put on their tent hose, uh, medication <laughs> reminders, um, help with bathing a couple few times a week if you want that, changing your linens, different things like that. Or if you uh, need a caregiver for a period of time because you had a surgery or some incident and you're like, I need somebody to kind of help me here for several hours a day to help me with certain things while I recover from whatever the event that you may have had is. Um, and so that's that private duty caregiver service that you pay out of pocket for. We have our hospice and palliative care. So hospice is end of life comfort care. If you have a terminal illness and you say, I don't wanna keep going to the hospital. I don't wanna have all the treatments for whatever this illness is. I just wanna be comfortable in, in my home or in my space, um, then uh, our hospice uh, is here for that. And then we have palliative care, which is a nurse practitioner who comes to you. You have um, different disease processes that you are trying to manage the symptoms, you're trying to understand. Uh, that nurse uh, really helps with symptom management, education, and then helping you make some decisions on you know, what you want to do or which way you want to go um, with the different diseases or disease uh, that's ailing you. And then um, we had a service that we just uh, acquired an organization that's called PACE, which is, stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And that's a service where the people live in their home, but they still need a lot of care, like almost nursing home or assisted living type care, but they don't want to come into a community. Um, it's a center where they get all of their care and their treatment. They even have a pharmacy to get their medication. They get their therapy um, and activities and they serve meals. So they just, it's kind of like a day program on steroids, really, um, for people in the community who want to access that. Um, a lot of times it's lower income people um, who need those supports. Um, and so there's a program that helps with that. So those are kind of like our array of services. Uh, Lutheran Senior Services is really uh, trying to make sure that we're able to meet the needs of uh, the community, we're able to meet the needs of people who want to age, what we call age in place. I'm sure you've heard that term quite a bit. Um, so as an organization, we're not only supporting people in a communal environment and the things they're going to need to come to them here, but we're also trying to make sure that we are here to serve the greater St. Louis um, area with our other housing and um, services. So I'm Denise and I represent that division of services. Um, today I'm here to talk about um, connections. So this month is our um, like older adults awareness month and the theme is from what I understand is powered by connection. 
This month is also like a mental health awareness month. I, I bought this t-shirt that says mental health squad just to do these presentations. So I bought this t-shirt for you guys. So I need you to know that and kind of admire like what I have going on here. It's okay to look at my chest today because I have some really good information about mental health here. Um, so we're kind of like coupling the Older Americans Month along with the mental health aspect. Um, and so really that's what I'm here to talk about um, is really connection and how important it is and how it affects your health. Uh, and, and that's something that we don't necessarily think about, how connection and connecting with people and things in our environment, getting outside of oneself really does affect like your overall health. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. So again, powered by connection, how isolation and connection relate to health. I was talking to a few people in the group and Beth, uh, just about stress, the, the, the thought of stress coming, coming out in my life. I'm assuming uh, a new role within the organization uh, so when I talked about that private duty service line, I, I'm going to be the director of the private duty service line here very soon. Um, so that's a big new job and promotion for me. I have three kids, um, and so two of them I call grown-ish <laughs> because they are moved into what our society says is adulthood, 18 beyond after high school. Um, so I have the oldest who's 20, and she did a year away at college and decided that I want to come home and go to community college and then find a local college after I get my associates. So navigating her back home, the rules, like I was talking to this young lady right here about like, they come back home and they're like, they want to come in at two or three o'clock in the morning. That's what they were doing at college. And you gotta be like, hey, you're grown, but you're not that grown. So let's talk about the fact that this house shuts down at a certain time. So like managing some of that and then I have an 18 year old who's graduating from high school in like 10 days and then she'll go off to college in Springfield, Missouri at, at most state. So helping her transition into that. And this child is the one who has anxiety. She has social anxiety. She has what she tells me is separation anxiety. I never noticed it because she has been a trained dancer and danced on stage and programs and she's the vice president of her, scene, of her class all four years and like one of those people who just achieves and does whatever and pushes past their anxiety, right? And you just don't even know they're having that problem. And then I have a son who's 13 and next year he'll be um, entering his last year of middle school and then I gotta prepare him for for you know high school beyond so that's like all really um stressful stuff but what you see there is i'm way more connected than i would like to be on most days and that's the life that many of you have lived you were forced into connections through your church through your kids school through your kids activities or people inviting you to things and you just are trying to make up excuses as to how you can say no to all these connections and the things you're invited to but then you switch to this part of life where your grownish kids don't need you. They drive, they're off in college, they have their own friends, they have their own jobs, and um, they just don't need you. Um, and then you move into different spaces of your life where people like move to different places. And you know, your connection or your reason to connect or your forced connections become less and less, which means you have to move into a new part of your life, a new old, do uh, used to have to do that, and that's like, building your own connections. Who are you when you're not being forced to connect? How much do you want to connect? How do you want to connect? Um, and understanding that that is like really important. So um, as you move into older adulthood, as you well know, like you can just spend more time alone. Um, social isolation can result in the feeling and feeling lonely and may have a profound effect on mental and physical well-being, uh, creating a barrier to healthier aging. So the National Library for Medicine, where I got some really good information from, um, describes social isolation as a state in which the individual lacks a sense of belonging socially, lacks engagement with others, has a minimal number of social contacts, and they are deficient in fulfilling and quality relationships. When we talk about social isolation, we also talk about loneliness and they're very connected, but they're a little bit different too. So, um, you know, we talk about loneliness when we talk about social isolation, there's a difference. Um, loneliness is the perception of being alone or separated from other people or 
a discrepancy between a person's desired and actual social relationship, right? So one word that is really highlighted in loneliness is the perception. Because I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, I know that I have. I could be in a room full of people and still feel very lonely. And so loneliness is not that you're in a room full of people. Loneliness isn't that you're at the family Memorial Day event and there's barbecue and there's pool parties and you're around all these people and you just feel connected because you're around people. You can still perceive yourself to be lonely in a crowd of people. And so, you know, we have to understand that as well. Um, so the University of Michigan presented a national poll on healthy aging in 2023. And they found that one in three adults aged 50 to 80 reported feeling isolated from others. Roughly the same number reported that once that they had once a week or less contact with people outside their home. So think about before you move them here, um, or people that you know who still live in the community, and they live alone on their subdivision or on their block, and they don't have a program going on downstairs from where they live. Um, there's not a neighborhood block party every night. And the grown people in their lives are like me, and they're going up 50 miles a minute, and they just don't make or think to have time to stop by your home or call you or whatever. And so your connection to people who don't live inside your home you might go a whole week or more and you don't see anybody, but maybe the mailman, you know? And so that's a very um, socially isolated world that a lot of people live in. Um, and so obviously being older adults yourself, you can guess that I have a couple of reasons uh, or causes for social isolation in older adults, but I still went ahead and listed some here, um, some reasons for that, chronic diseases and conditions, dementia, mobility changes, sensory impairment, depression and anxiety, low quality relationships, disruptive life events like retirement or loss of a spouse or friends, poverty, language barriers, lack of transportation, lack of nearby family, and then the people who live in like a more rural uh, location. So chronic diseases and conditions. Again, you're dealing with something new that you haven't dealt with before. The symptoms are exacerbating. Do you feel like socializing with people? No. Do you feel like you want to subject other people? Sometimes we're just like, I don't want to burden somebody else with whatever's happening with me. I don't want to depress somebody else with the things and the changes that, that I'm um, experiencing. So I want to withdraw. I don't want to be around people because you know I don't want them to see me like this. So that's a reason that people might isolate themselves. Dementia, especially the early stages. That stage where you know something's not right, you can't fix it, and you don't know when it pops up or doesn't pop up. Um, maybe you're losing some of the words that you want to express yourself in those early stages. It's super frustrating, and what do you do? You start to socially isolate yourself. And if you have friends or family, they might start to speak up for you to help you finish your thought or your sentence, and you're like, you know what, I might as well not even show up because I'm, I may forget and they're just gonna finish or I'm just gonna sit here and smile and let so-and-so talk for me, right? That's very difficult and a reason that somebody might socially isolate. Obviously, mobility changes. I can't get around like I used to. Everybody's gonna be moving so fast, I can't keep up, I don't wanna slow them down, um, it hurts. So those different mobility changes may cause somebody to socially isolate. Sensory impairment. I said, Lord help my family and friends, because as a young person, without these contacts in my lens, in my eyes, I need my glasses to find my glasses. I cannot see. Like literally, if I had glasses on and they fell, this is happened. They fell to the floor and I'm like, oh, where are they? And I start feeling around on the floor to try to find them like a blind person because I'm like, I'm kind of blind without these glasses in my eyes. Um, I've always had hearing problems. I had tubes in my ears twice as a kid. I got a hole in my left ear, eardrum from one of them. And sometimes I just don't hear things. Um, smell, I've had three sinus surgery. Like my face is so messed up, you guys. Like this is pretty. You guys are like, oh, she's so pretty. And that's 
all I got going on up here. Like, my face is jacked up. Like, I need to marry an ENT so that I can get, like, some free help for all the things that are wrong with my face, right? And so I've had three sinus surgeries, and when you lose your sense of smell because of all the gunk in your sinuses, you don't know. You're just walking through life like, and somebody says, oh my gosh, what's that smell? It smells so bad. And I'm like, it does. <laughs> What's it smell like? What? Well, it's, it's so offensive. You can't smell it. I am just going through life, and life is great. But I also can't smell your perfume. Other people are like, ooh, that's some strong perfume. Who's got perfume on? I, I had no idea. I can't tell. Um, but those sensory impairments really cause you to check out alive or socially isolate yourself if you notice them. I don't notice them. That's your problem, not mine. So I'm just fine. Uh, socializing with whomever. You're going to have to say my name 10 times before I hear it. And, you know, if you decide to pass gas near me, I don't freaking know. We're fine. You and I are good, right? Um, so definitely, sensory impairment. Depression and anxiety. We all experience depression and anxiety in different parts of our life. I'm a pretty confident person most days. Um, I've worked with LSS for 10 years now. My 10-year work anniversary is next week. Coincidentally, I start my new position on my 10-year work anniversary. Isn't that weird? But that's happening. Um, and so I am confident normally, but can I tell you, even though I was going into a panel for my interview with like eight people who I've been working with, most of them for a lot of years, we have some really good longevity here at the LSS organization. And the night before my interview, I got so anxious. All of a sudden, that confidence just flew right away, and my head got into this different space. And I was super anxious that night and the morning of, and I really just had to pray. I don't know if anybody else are praying people, but I really just had to pray to God and say, Lord, I don't know why. Um, this is happening, but I really need your help here. Like, I need to go into this interview confident. I really need to nail it. Um, so we all have moments of depression and anxiety, but sometimes those moments last a little bit longer. There's some people who have fought with depression and anxiety their whole life. I talked about my middle child who has all this anxiety, but she goes around in life like nothing, and you don't even know it, but the process inside her head to come into this room to talk to you guys, the process inside her head to get on that stage and dance is a different process than somebody who doesn't have like a more severe anxiety. Um, but that also has caused her to not go into situations and isolate herself at times. That's just the way it is. And so when you get um, older, I'm, I don't know if you, you guys are people who like used to be real brave and adventurous in your young years where you're like, yeah, I'll jump out of a plane in a second. Who wants to join me, right? And then you get to the point where you're like, jump out of a plane. I don't even want to go over a bridge and look down now. You know, like I just, my anxiety has changed from when I was younger. I'm like free and then now I'm middle age and I'm like, whoa, that seems real dangerous. I about that so you just you change and then I've seen plenty of seniors um, get to you know at an older age and it's like grandma was never like this when I was six years old she'd do anything with me and now she just hardly doesn't want to leave the house she's so anxious about everything things just change you grow in anxiety some of us so that causes you to um, isolate yourself low quality relationships some of us come from big old families and we just fight and love each other at the same time, and we, it doesn't matter, we're not shy about it, and it's great. Some of us come from small families, um, some of us come from really poor families where you held on to everything, you know, and some of us came from families that had a little bit more, where we could like spin and do more things, and, and some of us just have what, you know, the, the term these days, toxic family or friendship relationships, and we're like, I have reached an age where I am not gonna put myself in that toxicity, and I will isolate myself before I go into that. And so there's just people who have more low quality relationships and don't have that substance. Um, and that also will cause you to socially isolate. Um, disruptive events. I mean, I don't have to tell you about that. Retirement. You know, you had a purpose, even though you wish to God every day that he would have man up fall from heaven or winning lottery ticket would trip you up so that you didn't have to go to that job. But then you retire and you're like, 
what now? It sounds great. That's what we. That's what we're all trying to do. We're trying to retire. It sounds great. It sounds wonderful. But when it actually happens, you're like, oh, what do I do now? What's my purpose now? Where should I go? You know. And so that's a big disruptive life change. Even though it's something that we partially or fully plan for, loss of a spouse, you know, and other people who know you, the people who help shape you into who you are, and all of a sudden, one by one they start to leave your life. And now your longest relationship is like, well, I'll say 20, 25 years. Now at the age of 40 something, I'm like, whoa, you've known her for 25 years? That's that's a long time. But you're like, hun, I'm like 90 years old, 25 years, I've got nothing wear that are older than that. So no, this is not a very long relationship. Um, and then some people just begin to socially isolate because I don't want to retell my story to somebody that I just met. I really like to be able to go in in a conversation, you know, who, Johnny, you know, Johnny, we went to high school, his brother was so-and-so, oh yeah, Johnny, right? And then if I try to tell you that, that funny thing, then I'm like, oh, I gotta start with the beginning for, for you. And you know what? I don't wanna start with the beginning of my story. I just forget it, just forget it, you know? So those disruptive life events really make a difference. Poverty. The people who are seniors and they're like, I'm living on a fixed income, and you may feel like you're living on a fixed income, but somebody else's fixed income is way different than your fixed income, and it, it causes you to check out and socially isolate. I can't do that, I can't afford that. Um, and so you don't wanna also burden anybody. You know, if I've got my friend who's got three or four times the fixed income that I have, I don't wanna treat me all the time. I don't feel sorry for me I don't you know forget it I'll just check out I'll just so socially isolate obviously language barriers are huge so if we think about people whose first language is not English who immigrated here um, and they get to become a senior adult um, sometimes when we talk about people with dementia you go back to your native tongue like obviously it makes sense and so sometimes though those people with the language barriers were talking too fast or too slow or we somebody's had a stroke and they're slower in their words and english isn't your first language anyway and now i really can't understand you you know what forget about it i'm not going to go to the thing i'm going to go ahead and socially isolate right lack of transportation is huge i see it all the time with my seniors like I can't drive anymore, driving makes me anxious, I've had a few accidents, you know, whatnot. Um, and so getting around to places that I like to get around, sure, I'd like to go to the bingo hall across town. I can't, I grew up in the hill, and the hill has whatever, and I would love to go to their annual blah, blah, blah. But I don't drive from town and country to the hill, and who's gonna take me? Forget about it, I'm not gonna do that thing, I'm just gonna isolate. Um, lack of nearby family, you know, we have a lot of our kids who move away and it's like I have you, I have a kid in California, I got a kid here, I got a kid there, and you know, you don't have those connections here. Um, and then obviously rural locations kind of speaks for itself. So it is said that social isolation can be deadly. When I read that, I'm like, oh, deadly? That seems a bit dramatic, right? But not so. I mean, would you believe that the magnitude of risk associated with social isolation could be compared to that of cigarette smoking? Now, 30 years ago, people would smoke in their offices, they'd smoke uh, in the restaurant, they'd smoke everywhere. I mean, like, that's just the way it was. But then when you know better, you do better. And all the research and all the statistics came out and said, whoa, smoking is really bad for your health. And so now we don't do it as much anymore, or you can't do it so socially or publicly or whatever because it's, it's not good for you. And who would have thought that social isolation can be just as harmful to your health as smoking cigarettes? Seems wild, but true. Um, studies have linked social isolation with a 29% higher all risk for mortality. Meaning you can socially isolate yourself to death or sickness. I mean, let that sink in. It seems like not a big deal to just be to myself. And a lot of us talk about protecting our peace. I'm gonna protect my peace. I'm just gonna stay right here in my little square all by myself and I don't have to deal with all the crap. 
you know, I'm protecting my peace. But you're socially isolated, you're lonely, um, and there's a lot of things that you check out of that really just have an overall effect on your health and your mortality. It's kind of wild. Um, and there's a researcher, Julianne Holt Lundstad, who found that loneliness increases mortality risk by 50%. So she finds it to be an even bigger deal um, than some others. Social isolation and loneliness have been associated with higher rates of high blood pressure, heart disease, weakened immune system, dementia, and just overall functional decline. Um, I've done other presentations and talks here and some of our other communities, and we talk about COPD, and we talk about kidney disease, um, and all these other th heart disease. And we talk about how one of these diseases feed into the other. If you have a kidney disease or end-stage kidney disease, um, if you have diabetes, if you have diabetes, then you have a greater chance of having kidney disease. If you have kidney disease, you have a greater chance of blah, 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 right? So all these different things work together. Never have we really highlighted the fact that social isolation can also cause higher rates in some of these other diseases. And we know, we know that some of these diseases cause other diseases. High blood pressure is such a big deal because it causes some other problems. If it's not controlled over time, it's gonna cause you some other problems. And so imagine socially isolating yourself into sickness and that sickness exacerbating into another sickness that feeds into another sickness. But that's the fact of the matter. Uh, lonely older adults may have a greater tendency to drink alcohol and exercise less. Now when I read that, I just feel like lonely people, you don't even have to put the older adult in there. I think anybody who's lonely has a higher chance of just deciding to drink more and they don't have a reason to move because they're just going to stay in their square and you know they're just going to exercise less. So I think that's just anybody who's lonely. Um, but today we're talking about older adults. Um, so again, the theme, powered by connection. What can you do to foster connection? Um, and you're already part way there. You live in a Lutheran Senior Services community. And so I say congratulations on making a great decision for your overall health and well-being by just moving in to the space that you reside right here. Because there are a lot of things that uh, the organization, the community, Beth and her group, and you guys, having all your wealth of experience and knowledge and connections, have formed your own groups and clubs and connections, and you bring people into this space to make it a lot easier for people to connect and do things. So definitely good choice on being a Lutheran Senior Service resident. Um, but we really need to understand the value of friendship at all stages of our life and not to be afraid to diversify our friendships. If you grew up in a rural area, if you grew up in, so I go to all the different Lutheran Senior Service communities, and so it's really interesting to travel to all of them, um, especially in St. Louis, because depending on what pocket of St. Louis you grew up in, you had some similar, but also some very different experiences. And you can see the personalities of each community based on the people who live there and where they came from. So when I go to our Breeze Park, St. Charles community location, you know, there's a lot of people who came off of farms or it was very rural in that area. You know, it was like nothing but, you know, fields and fields of stuff. Um, and it's really grown into a, a much more urban area now, but that's not how they grew up. And so the people in that community is a different make than the people in the West County um, community. Even if you migrated from California to West County, you know, like it's just a different feel here. And then when I go to Webster Groves, Old Webster, you know, like the different type of people, some of them are people who came from the city or the hill and kind of migrated out to Webster and some of them grew up in Webster. And, you know, so each community has their different personality and the different people who make it up. Um, but when you come here, you do meet some people who just come from different spots, um, whether they grew up wealthy or they grew up in poverty, whether they had to really work hard or whether they were housewives or executives or whatever it is that you were, now you're here together existing. And so it's a really great time to kind of act like a college student and say, I'm open to meeting and talking to all different people. I'm open to learning about a group of people that I've never really had a chance to interact with before. And so diversifying your friendship networks 
is a really great thing and you're in a great community to just be able to do that and learn from each other's experiences, backgrounds, and differences because you're still here, you still have the ability to learn and so why, why not take that opportunity to go ahead and learn from one another even though somebody seems really different um, from you. I have a coworker, I, again I started here 10 years ago, almost to the date next week, and um, when I interviewed for the job, we didn't know that they were hiring like three people for the same position, just different territories. And I remember a coworker of mine, uh, when we started, we got to know each other, we're still very good friends. I'm like, we're friends now. We met here at Lutheran Senior Services, we're really good friends now. Um, we've been to football games together. I've been to her daughter's like graduation. She's been to my kids' sports activities and so on and so forth. Um, but I was born in Columbia, Missouri, and I was there until I was about 11 or 12 years old. At the time that I was in Columbia, Missouri, I'm kind of like one of those country girls, right? We were barefoot all the time. I played in the creek, um, fields and fields and fields of stuff everywhere. It's so odd, odd when I go back um, to visit like the Mizzou area, and I'm like, oh my God, they built so much stuff, right? Um, so, and she grew up in Washington, Missouri, so kind of, the, kind of the same, similar sort of situation, but then we grow up, and I live in Overland, Missouri, and she lives in O'Fallon, Missouri, and um, I remember that she told me a story about us interviewing, apparently her interview was behind mine, and as I left, I had somebody who was picking me up, and I hopped in their car. Now, the job that we were interviewing for was a job where we had to like travel around the city, you need your own car. And she was like, I was wondering, how's this girl gonna get this job? She wouldn't even have her own car. Um, my daughter was in the hospital getting a bone marrow transplant at the time. Um, things that she didn't know, we got to learn about each other. And then I meet her, and I'm like, who's this woman from O'Fallon? She seems, seems kind of snotty, but we're here, we're gonna work together. But you know, we got to know each other, and now, like I said, we've done a lot of stuff together. Um, and so, you know, those friendships are are important, and you know, you just really get to dig into people, and, and definitely, it's a good thing. Um, but understanding the value of friendship, uh, nearly 40% of adults have a close friend that's at least 15 years older or 15 years younger than them. Um, so again, the whole multi-generational friendships are really important. Uh, support groups for caregivers, for uh, mental health, for specific diseases, for bereavement and grief can all help you with your emotional outlet, help you reduce stress, and also help you make connections. Um, and that's when different people from back different backgrounds can come together and say, we're different, but we're both experiencing grief because we lost our spouse of 70 years, 50 years, 60 years. Um, we're different, but we're both caregivers of somebody who has Parkinson's and dementia. And if you had to be an actual caregiver for another human being, especially an adult human being, it is not for the faint of heart, it is not for the weak, it is very difficult. And that is a way that you can come together with someone even though you're not the touchy-feely type, I don't really like to talk about it, I kind of handle my own stuff, there's a lot of value in just being in the room, even if you don't speak. So um, definitely, any sort of uh, caregiver, support groups, mental health, disease-specific, all those things are just really good places to connect and a really good outlet. Volunteer. Um, so I do have some brochures that either Beth has handed out to you or will. I know that she has a, a robust volunteer program that she is building here. And so whether you decide to volunteer here at your community because it's easier uh, to get to, better for your schedule, um, or if you're the type of person like me who's like, ah, I don't know if I wanna connect that closely with the people that I live with and see every day. I'd rather volunteer outside of like where I live, you know? Then there's a lot of opportunity for you to do some volunteerism that's outside of this community. I know um, we need hospice volunteers. We have a, a volunteer group called the Senior Connections Plus. We need volunteers for that. Uh, food banks need volunteers, hospitals need volunteers, you know, go hold babies in the NICU if you want to at any local children's hospital. My um, daughter who wants to be a nurse who's graduated from high school, she just started volunteering at Rankin Jordan 
Children's Hospital. I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but it's an acute, uh, like a long-term acute care hospital um, here in St. Louis and like the Maryland Heights area. And it's been really profound and eye-opening for her. Um, each little hospital has like a Ronald McDonald room. When my daughter went to her two transplants, the Ronald McDonald room saved our life so many times to just be an outlet to get a snack, to take a shower, for resources, and again, to talk to other parents who had kids who were going through some really tough times. And I am a social worker, but I'm also a person who doesn't necessarily like to tell my business or get too deep, but man, did it really help me um, having those resources and really opening up to family members. And I've realized that telling my own story and experience, how, how much I've blessed other people by just opening up and sharing my own um, walk through caregiving as, as a mother of a child who was born with sickle cell disease and who had two transplants in order to cure it. That's, you know, that, that a lot happens. And I've been blessed to tell my story openly and I know that it's helped other people. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, volunteering in whatever sort of interest. And even if you only do it once a month, one, you know, whatever amount of time you have, it uh, can be fulfilling and it's definitely helpful to those organizations who depend on volunteers to exist. Um, also, request a volunteer from a local organization for yourself or for your loved one. Again, we're powered by connection. It is okay to seek connections in all the ways that we have available in our community, in our area. We're in St. Louis. We have a lot of organizations that have a lot of resources. And when it's your turn to need it, then go ahead and be okay with needing it and go ahead with being okay with accepting or reaching out to get a volunteer for yourself. You've given a lot to this world. And so if you need somebody to give to you, even if it's once a month, even if that person starts by doing something small with you and you build a connection and then you're like, oh, I'd like to see them a little more often, that's gonna mean a lot to you. And I just think that people need to know that it's okay for you to be the one who actually needs to do the reaching out. Um, attend programs and activities right here in your community like you are doing now. Invite your neighbors to walk with you to the activity or have a meeting spot on your floor that's just open 20 minutes before whatever activity or program, this is the meeting spot and everybody knows it. And so if somebody wants to walk together, they don't have to ask, oh, can I walk with you or what time are you going? Just like we always have a meeting spot 20 minutes before the program, anybody wants to, we'll gather and we'll walk down there together. That way the people who are a little bit more shy or feel a little more alone, just know that they can silently just kind of join the group and walk on down with you, right? So that's another way to make a connection without making it a big deal, right? Some people don't like a big deal made out of things. Um, stay connected with your family and friends through whatever way works for them and you, such as video chat, email, or social media. We want to connect with our young people. So I have two sisters um, who do not have any kids, and there's my brother and I who each have, we have three kids each. And we hear from our sisters about these teenagers don't text me back or they don't call me, or blah, 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 blah. They want to stick to their, excuse me, their way of communicating. And I get it. We're old school. We want to communicate in our way. I still, like, I, so many people work remote, and I was always the type of uh, social worker or worker who I'm like, I'm not going to keep emailing this person. Our office is just down and around. I'll get my steps in. I go around to her office. I'm just going to go talk to her in person. Well, she's at home now. I can't just walk over to her desk and talk to her in person about the things. So I have to adjust, I have to adapt, and I have to utilize the resources that work, that exist and that work for the both of us. So that means I can do, we have Microsoft Teams, I can do a Microsoft Teams video chat with her, or call, um, or um, email, or whatever it is that works for them. And social media is huge, not just for our young people, now, we all use different platforms, but I've noticed my kids, they use Instagram. I don't know if you guys have heard of it or use it. Instagram is huge for like my teenage kids. Facebook is huge for us older people. And so my kids have joined Facebook in order to just connect with the old heads. And then the old heads have joined Instagram and Snapchat. 
so that we can be on a platform that, that works for them. I use Facebook far more than I use Instagram or Snapchat, but I'm there and I get to swipe up on their story and like see what they're up to and what they've been doing. So I, I've got to adapt um, to whatever resources we have available in today's world if I want to connect with different people in my life. So um, just stay connected in whatever way works for you and the other person. Um, let's see. Uh, stay connected with people. Uh, join senior centers, day centers, social clubs, and your church. Church groups are wonderful ways to connect with your faith and the people who share your faith. If you don't aren't able to go to your church as much as possible, again, there's the whole Ask for a Church Volunteer. Um, and then I just did like to highlight that the Bible and God have plenty to say about connections. You can just even do a Google search. What does God or the Bible say about connections? And God says, and the Bible says quite a lot about the importance of connection. Perception is reality. If you or someone you know feels or perceives that they're socially isolated or they feel lonely, um, regardless of spending time in groups or activities, then there is likely no need to attempt to prove them otherwise or uh, to convince someone that they're not lonely. You're not lonely. I see you at all the activities. Why do you keep saying you're lonely? Perception is reality. If they feel that they're lonely, then we have to believe that, we have to understand that, and we don't need to be wasting our time trying to convince them that they're not. Um, as always, speak with your physician. I would encourage you or anyone who um, you are trying to help, schedule and keep your physician appointments, your screenings, your dental checkups, your key vaccinations, because sometimes some of the things we're experiencing may be a symptom of something else. And we're thinking, oh, I'm just up at age. Oh, this is just my stage of life. Oh, this is blah, blah, blah. But it could be a symptom of something else. So keeping those annual screenings, tests, uh, doctor's appointments, dental checkups, all those different things are highly important because sometimes you learn that there's something happening within your body that mimics something else and we're just chalking it up to whatever we decide that, that WebMD or Dr. Google or a neighbor experienced the same thing and, and her problem was this, right? Um, so, and also it's just as important to take action professionally regarding our social and mental health. I know that I am a little younger than you and I say I come from a generation where mental health what? You don't, talk, you don't really talk about that and going to get treatment? What, what is treatment for mental health? That is nonsense. Like, we don't do it. We just go to work, find an activity, sleep it off, eat it off, whatever it is. That's how you deal with it. Um, but that's not how you deal with it. And so don't be afraid, again, to come into this new age. These kids are showing us the way in certain um, aspects that um, mental health is overall health. And it is important, and sometimes we need to get a professional involved in order to help improve our mental health so that we can improve our overall health. Um, so if you need to see somebody for a little bit, then you, you should definitely do that. Um, I say I've never been as old before as I am now, and neither have you. Our bodies change, and our bodies do not belong to someone else so we cannot expect to always have the same symptoms or results as another person as, uh, or as when we were younger, right? So just because your symptom was this and it equivalent to that for you doesn't mean that it's the same for me. So we can't depend on our neighbors to always show us the way. We can depend on our neighbors to um, let us know when they see some changes, uh, maybe give us some something to think about, but we really need to get things checked out for ourselves and not judge other people for their symptoms and way of dealing with things or the treatment being different than ours. My body is mine, yours is yours, and, and we have to recognize that um, our bodies are older than they were, you know, yesterday, last week, last year, and so that means that's going to come with some changes that we've never experienced before. We have to acknowledge that and make sure that we address that appropriately. So, continue to grow in your current connections. Don't be afraid to build new connections. 
Your health depends on it. Again, I'm Denise Travis with Lutheran Senior Services, home and community-based services. If you have any questions that I can answer or anything you'd like to add, I'm happy to hear it. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, and I don't think you should ever be anxious because you have a wonderful personality, wonderful presentation, and you make it so interesting for us. So good luck in your journey, but I, will you be ever seeing people in your journey like this? Yeah, so thank you for those kind words. I really do appreciate that. So in my new role, I will still, once I get acclimated to um, trying to manage 70 plus people and the new systems and all that, I do expect to be back in the communities um, here and there. There'll be somebody who will be um, taking over this role, so they'll be hiring somebody for that. That person, I will take them around and kind of show them what I do and how I do it, and then also let them do it the way that they need to do it. Um, but I'll be kind of help guide, guide that a little bit. And there's no way that I can be disconnected after 10 years um, with our various communities. So I do expect to continue to connect with the communities, also be your go-to person when you need a private caregiver inside your space. Um, and then I still feel like I have things to offer and give. And so whoever takes my spot, I will ask them if they'll just throw me in um, the mix for a presentation every once in a while. So I'm not done with you guys. Good. You're not rid of me just yet. Good.